play in there if you would. Let's read together. And when I think that God, his son not sparing, sent him to die, I scarce can take it in. That on the cross, my burden gladly bearing, he bled and died to take away my sin. Let's sing the last verse, when Christ shall come. When Christ shall come, with shout of acclamation, and take me home, what joy shall fill my heart, then I shall bow in humble adoration, and declared an awesome truth that you are great there is none greater than you oh father forgive us when we have made something else out to be greater some other person some thing in our life some future as yet unrealized hope that that's so wonderful so great if we could only just get there if we could only just have that oh father forgive us Forgive us when our focus hasn't been where it should have been on you. And today, would you realign our focus? Would you help us to, if, if it's been off, may we realign. If, if it has been on you, oh, may it become even sharper, the focus of how great you are, of what you've done, and how you've redeemed us, how much you love us. Oh, God, we praise you. We thank you. We thank you for this place, this time, and these wonderful people. We ask that our fellowship together will be just like a sweet sacrifice in your presence. We praise you and thank you in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated, please. Just a, a few announcements. Wayne, you asked for a, just a moment to share something that you had a testimony of. Would, would you do that now for us? I, I want to give you this mic, or you can come up and use this mic. I'm just going to flip it on. There we go. Okay. Orange mic. Great. You know, Pastor, sometimes uh, <coughs> things in the Christian life in the church come out as nice theory. And we sung this morning about how great our God is. Yes. I'd like to share how that works out in practice, <laughs> at least one way for me. Uh, I started a new job this week, and uh, it's been a, it's pumping propane, <coughs> delivering propane. It's been a year and a half since I've done that. In that year and a half, my physical abilities have deteriorated, my strength, my stamina. Hmm. Uh, a month ago, my chiropractor looked at x-rays of my hips, and he said, oh, man, he says, you're going to need hip replacements because I had a constant soreness in my hips all the time. And the uh, first, first three days were training modules on the computer, which I did mostly at home. And I thought that was tiring. <laughs> it really wore me out. But I was not looking forward to having to climb in and out of the truck 25 times, 30 times a day. And there's a two thick, two inch thick rubber hose that's 120 feet long that you got to drag uh, to the tanks and sometimes it's uphill and over obstacles and all kinds of stuff and uh, I pray Lord you got to you got to give me the strength for this you got to help me 
My knees were somewhat sore the first day because I, I worked Thursday, Friday, Saturday. Friday, Saturday, I've had no soreness at my knees. I've had no soreness in my hips. Mm. And uh, the sorest part of me is my shoulder where I put the hose over and have to drag it. Yeah. <laughs> and even that's not that bad. So I just want to thank the Lord for, you know, I've, you know, looking towards this job, I'm thinking, you know, am I getting to the age where I just can't do this stuff anymore? Mm. But our God is able to give us the grace and the strength and whatever we need for whatever he calls us to do. Yeah. And he's a very practical God. Yeah. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Yeah. Thank you, brother. I feel in my spirit. There are a couple of people here this morning that needed to hear that. And uh, so thank you. Thank you for sharing that. Let me read from uh, 1 John chapter 3, where it says here, See how great a love the Father has bestowed on us, that we should be called the children of God. And such we are. For this reason, the world does not know us because it did not know him. Beloved, now we are children of God, and it has not yet appeared what we will be. We know that when he appears, we will be like him because we will see him just as he is. Oh, how great a love the Father has bestowed on us. Let's sing this song, How Deep the Father's Love for Us.
want to say to Praise the Lord. I don't. I was listening to Chuck Swindoll uh, Friday morning, not knowing what the radio program was going to be about. But he went through the description of Christ being beaten, beaten on the cross. Mm. And for a few seconds, I thought I was going to get sick. Yeah. But I'm so thankful yeah. that he didn't bow out of the plan of God. That's right. I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus Nazarene. Yeah. I wonder how he could love me. I was a sinner. I was condemned. I was unclean. But God, who is rich in mercy, brought me to him. Amen. Amen. Lord, I want to be faithful, Lord, even to stand up and testify today. I want to make sure it was of God. But I had my shouting shoes on. I had my head covered with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. I'm not ashamed of the gospel Amen. of Christ, Amen. for it is the power of God unto salvation. Either we'll go through the blood of Jesus or we won't be going. And I pray for my brothers and sisters, not just my physical brothers and sisters, but you are our church family. And I heard Charles Stanley preaching at Opportunity, and I enjoyed the message, thought no more of it. I got on Facebook, and I saw Robbie, your sister, had fallen in her herself, and I saw her laying all swollen bruised. And I started praying for her over that internet. Mm. See, we have our opportunities, yes, but God only knows That's how right. we be faithful. I just praise That's the right. Lord this morning. I love him so much. Amen. Praise Amen. God. Praise God. Yeah, his wounds have paid my ransom. Yes, my. The depths of his suffering. And that's what we're remembering today as we take these elements and uh, remember his suffering and his death. Amen. Well, I was reminded again this morning by somebody uh, that it is hunting season. Huh. Well, this week I've heard, you know, what sounded like cannon shot. It's rifle shooting and shotgun shooting all around here. And uh, I, I used to deer hunt. I don't anymore, but I used to. And uh, it was just an excuse to go and, you know, go for a nap in the forest, really, as far as I was concerned. <laughs> <laughs> you find a nice, sunny, south-facing spot against a rock, and pretty soon, before you knew it, you were dead asleep, and you were having a great old nap in the bush. It was great. It was wonderful. Um, it, it was good, but, you know, I was never much of a good shot, hey? I, I, I've, I've shot a couple of times at deer, never hit them, um, and it's probably, you know, the better thing anyway for them, yeah. <laughs> but, but when you go hunting, you, you intend to shoot something, but you don't always hit, do you? You don't always hit what you're aiming at, and, uh, and you end up missing the mark sometimes. And that, that's really what Paul talks about in Romans 3. We can, we can miss the mark physically if we're shooting either a, oh yeah, sorry, kids. Yeah, you can go downstairs to Children's Church. Forgot about that. Sorry about that, Melissa. Yeah. All right. We have Augustus there too? Sure. There we go. All right. Good stuff. Um, we can, we can miss the mark physically either by shooting an arrow or a gun, or we can, we can certainly miss the mark spiritually. Uh, Romans 3, verse 23 to 25, Paul says this, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. That the, the Greek word used there for falling short is literally to miss the mark. It's, a, it's a, actually an archery term that when you're shooting at the target, you, your arrow drops short of the target. It didn't even get to the target, let alone hit the bullseye. It, it didn't even hit the target. It dropped before the target. And that's what Paul, the word Paul is using here. For all have sinned and fall short. All have sinned and missed the target. And what's the target? Of the glory of God. The glory of God is the target. And we could shoot an arrow and try to hit that and we miss every time. But, verse 24, being justified, that is being made right, getting to the point where we can hit the target, being justified as a gift by his grace through the redemption, which is in Christ Jesus. We just sang about that. And then verse 25, 
whom God displayed publicly as a, and then in the New American Standard Bible and in some other Bibles, we get to this word that is like a weird one, okay? We don't use this word in the English language anymore. And it's kind of one of those awkward, weird words. The word is propitiation. Ooh, there's a, just a strange word. God displayed publicly as a propitiation in his blood through faith. What in the world is that? Hey? The Greek word here means the act or place of showing mercy to sinful creatures. Okay? So God displayed publicly Jesus Christ as a propitiation in his blood through faith. My aim today is to help us understand this unusual word and then through it maybe understand a bit better what God did by sending his son to die on the cross. And I hope that all of this will help each one of us to appreciate the sacrament of communion in a deeper way and make it even more meaningful to our spirits. In this verse in Romans 3, Paul tells us that God displayed Christ Jesus publicly as a propitiation, there's that weird word, through faith in his blood. And we said that propitiation means the act or place of showing mercy. The act of showing mercy or the place where mercy is shown, okay? Now, it's one thing. If somebody does something mean and hurtful to a stranger, yeah, you can kind of go, well, that wasn't very nice. That was kind of nasty. And you can kind of go on. But it's another thing if they do that to a close friend. Ah, now we're getting into, oh, boy, I, you shouldn't have been doing that. Now, if someone intentionally does something mean and hurtful to you, Man, oh man, that's on a whole other level, isn't it? But you see, our sin, yours, mine, our intentional, willful breaking of one of God's laws is like shaking our fist in God's face and saying, God, I don't care if I hurt you. Sin is like a direct blow to God's heart, his heart of love for us. Now, I, one of the fellows in the Bible that really understood this was Joseph. You know, the coat of many colors guy in the Old Testament. You know, he was sold by his brothers to slavery to Egypt, and he got bought at the slave market by Potiphar, who was the cap head of the, the palace guard. And he has Joseph working in his house and realizes, hey, this guy's a really good worker. Man, this guy's a, a manager. I'm going to put him in charge. And he gave him more and more responsibility until Joseph is basically the head manager of the entire estate of Potiphar. And then we get to Genesis 39, verse 6. Genesis 39, verse 6. Now Joseph was handsome in form and appearance. In other words, ladies, he was a hunk. Oh, I tell you what. And it came about after these events that his master's wife looked with desire at Joseph and she said, lie with me. But he refused and said to his master's wife, Behold, with me here, my master does not concern himself with anything in the house, and he has put all that he owns in my charge. There is no one greater in this house than I, and he has withheld nothing from me except you, because you are his wife. How then could I do this great evil, okay, and here it is, and sin against God? Ah, Joseph got it. Joseph understood that committing adultery with his boss's wife wasn't just against his boss. It would be against God too. God is the one who says, be holy because I am holy. And when we aren't, when we willfully and deliberately choose to go against God's holiness, it's like shoving a knife into God's loving and perfect heart. And God tried to warn our first parents how serious sin is. He told Adam, 
don't eat of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Or if they did, God said, in the day you eat of it, you will surely die, he said. I often wondered, how come Adam and Eve didn't drop dead when they ate the fruit? I, I couldn't quite figure that out. Until someone told me that the original Hebrew meaning of that phrase, in the day you eat of it, you will surely die, it means in the day you eat from it, dying, you will die. Oh, now I get it a little bit better. What God was saying is that a death will start to invade your soul, your spirit, dying, you will die. Dying, death will start inside and eventually work its way through your entire being until one day you will end up physically dead. Death entered in through that one act of disobedience, which resulted in a physical death, which was never intended. Adam and Eve were meant to live forever. It was a perfect existence that they had. But now, the only way to deal with sin is for something or someone to pay the penalty of death. But instead of destroying us, instead of bringing down his rightful wrath on us, God chose to destroy sin and its curse. He chose to find a way that we could be reconnected, a way to fix what sin bent so that we can no longer hit the target, that we are always falling short. God chose to show mercy to his sinful creatures, us. Mercy. Mercy means withholding what we deserve. It means withholding punishment and ultimate destruction. For Adam and Eve, it meant that God provided a covering for them. As, in, as it says in Genesis 3.21, the Lord God made garments of skin for Adam and his wife and clothed them. Now think about that. Where did God get the skin? From an animal. Something had to die in order for Adam and Eve to be covered. Wow. Wow. Over the next few thousand years, animal sacrifices are being offered to God. And then we get to Moses, where God institutionalizes animal sacrifices and how they're to be carried out in detail. And God provides the place of showing mercy, the propitiation. Remember we said propitiation was the place or act of showing mercy. God provided the place of showing mercy to sinful creatures, and that was the Holy of Holies. This was the innermost room of the tabernacle, which was the kind of the tent, goatskin tent, that they carried around with them in the wilderness for 40, 40 years, plus a number of years after that, or the temple, which was eventually built in Jerusalem. And, and it, this Holy of Holies was that innermost room, way at the back, with a big, thick curtain over it, inside of which the golden Ark of the Covenant, you know, that, that golden box with the long handles and poles and the angels with the wings going up and touching over the top. And, and inside was the Ten Commandments, and I think there was a jar of manna, and there might have been Aaron's rod. Aaron's rod. had the buds on it, yes. And so we have this place where God said his presence would be continually. And because of God's holy presence, and conversely, because of sinful humanity, only the high priest could go in behind that curtain into the Holy of Holies, and only once a year, and never without the blood of a sacrificed animal. He had a bowl with blood that he had, could only enter if he had that bowl in his hands. And then what he would do is that he would sprinkle that blood He'd dip his fingers in the bowl and splash that blood on what was called the mercy seat, the place of God's mercy, where his glory would touch earth so that people's sin would be covered and God's glory and holiness wouldn't be destroy them all. 
And the verses that best, best capture this thought are Romans 5, verses 8, 9, and 10. Let me read them for you. But God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us, much more than having now been justified, that is, legally declared innocent, even though we're guilty, having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from the wrath of God through him. That's mercy. For if while we were his enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved by his life. Paul tells us that because of sin, God's wrath, his righteous anger was stirred up. And because of sin, we were God's enemies. As Paul told us earlier in chapter 3, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Everybody has missed the mark. The arrow has landed short. We all deserve judgment and punishment and justice must be served. Now let me try to put this in a, into a modern day parable. A parable is a a story of earthly things to help us connect with heavenly understanding or understanding about the kingdom of God. So Hartley Love and his wife were sitting in their living room, enjoying a quiet evening, listening, listening to music and basking in the glow of the fire crackling in the fireplace. The tranquility of the moment was shattered as a man donning a ski mask and brandishing a handgun suddenly appeared in front of them. In the aftermath of the home invasion and robbery, it was discovered that not only had Hartley's wife been killed, but he was left paralyzed from the waist down. Months later, after his recovery, and after the courtroom was remodeled to allow the judge to sit behind the bench in his wheelchair, Judge Hartley Love noticed that the first case on his docket was that of the young man who had invaded their home and shattered their lives. Now, let me just put brackets here. Please just suspend the conflict of interest issues for the sake of the story and let me continue, okay? So reading the accused name... Judge Hartley Love realized just who this young man was. Years before, the judge had dealt with a sad case of an impoverished young single mom who had a little boy, and that boy was this young man. Back then, the judge, along with his wife, had reached out to this single mom and helped her and her son get their feet back under them. They found them a decent place to live, paid the rent and bought groceries until she landed a good job with benefits. The judge and his wife had continued to interact in the lives of these two, but had lost track, uh, contact with the boy when he turned 16 and took off to the big city. And now, this same man was being escorted in handcuffs to the prisoner's box. No jury trial took only a few hours and the courtroom was almost too quiet as Judge Love started to read out the verdicts. To the charge of home invasion, aggravated circumstances, guilty. To the charge of for forcible confinement, guilty. To the charge of use of a firearm in the commission of an offense, guilty. To the charge of murder in the second degree, guilty. After finishing, the judge looked up at the prisoner who was looking at the floor. Son, look at me, he said sternly. The convicted criminal looked up slowly. The judge continued. You deserve 25 years in prison with no chance of parole. Not only have you broken the law and justice demands an accounting, you have also impacted my life and caused me untold grief and pain. For all this, you are guilty as charged. Now, listen to me carefully. I want to give you an opportunity to walk out here a free man to change the course of your life and have the power to make new choices. If you want to, I have asked my son to serve out your prison sentence in your place, and he has agreed. What do you say? 
For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to judge the world, but that the world might be saved through him. He who believes in him is not judged. He who does not believe in him has been judged already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. As Sherry and Steve come and play through our closing song, I want you to listen carefully. You see, through sin, through my sin, through your sin, there was a law broken and justice provoked which were to be attended to. And Christ by his sacrifice has satisfied both so that neither the wrath of God nor the penalty of sin would fall on the person who has faith in the blood of Christ for their propitiation, the mercy of God. God does not want his righteous anger to fall on the very creatures that he has formed and loves. But the choice is up to you. It's up to me. Through faith in Jesus, his life, his suffering on the cross, the shedding of his blood, his death and resurrection, you can escape the effects of God's righteous anger and judgment against sin. Have you done that? Have you placed your faith in Jesus? Have you told him, Lord, I need you? If not, why not do it now? Do it today. God is waiting for you to trust in all he's done to make a way for you. It's, it's not complicated. It's just simple saying something to the effect of, God, I deserve punishment and ultimate destruction because of my sin. I'm asking you for mercy. Please wash me in the blood of Jesus. Forgive my sin. Come into my heart and life through the power of your spirit. Change my life to a new direction. God will do it as you have faith in him. If you have done that, oh friend, thank him. Praise him for what he has done. Let him know that you still need him. As you hold the elements of communion, remind yourself that these are the symbols of God's mercy. This is the place of propitiation. Jesus took your place. Would you stand with me as we sing together our closing song? Lord, I come, I confess, bowing here, I find my rest, and without you, I fall apart. You're the one that guides my
Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts through the presence of your Holy Spirit that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. You who are walking in fellowship with God and are in love and harmony with your neighbors, and you who do truly earn and earnestly repent of your sin and intend to lead a new life following the commandments of God and walking from this time in his holy ways, draw near with faith and take this holy sacrament to your comfort and humbly bowing, make your honest confession to Almighty God. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, who in mercy gave your Son, Jesus Christ, to suffer death upon the cross for our redemption, accept our praise, we ask. We thank you for your love, for the gift of your Son, for the sacrifice he made in our behalf, and for the forgiveness of our sins and the cleansing of our hearts for the present witness of your Holy Spirit to our hearts that we are your children. Grant that as we receive this bread and cup in the memory of Christ's death and suffering, in communion with you and with your children, we may be being partakers of Christ's body and blood who taught us to pray saying, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. On the night he was betrayed, Jesus took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's receive the bread. In the same way, after supper... He took the cup and he gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you, for this is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. Father God, thank you for the opportunity to remember again that the place of mercy was at the cross. The act of mercy was Jesus shedding his blood and giving his life for us. Oh, Father, may we walk in this newness of life that has been won for us through our propitiation Yes, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. We bless your holy name. Amen. Would you stand as we sing? I, uh, this is a song that I sang, we sang years and years ago. It's been a long time since I've sung it. Uh, yeah, go ahead and stand. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. We'll try to get the timing right. We hang on to the third word. Bless the Lord. We hang on to that a bit, and then we'll keep going. So let's try this, okay? Bless the Lord, my soul.
all friends love God, love each other, and go out there and be the church and bless his name. Amen.